right, well, welcome, everyone. Um, thank you for attending this early morning session. Uh, we appreciate you guys being here uh, so early. Uh, my name is Paul Fryer. I'm the worldwide tech leader for retail and CPG industries at AWS. And I'm really excited to have Daniel here, VP of Enterprise Architecture with Adidas, joining us on stage today, going to give a talk about um, some of the transformations that Adidas has been making to the cloud and a little bit of um, some generative AI discussions. So a whole bunch of stuff to get into. I just want to give a quick introduction on my team, what we do in the retail team at AWS. And then uh, I'll pass it over to uh, Daniel to give the story from Adidas. And then we'll do a little bit of Q&A together. And, and, and if we have time, we'll do some Q&A with the audience as well. So that's essentially the, the agenda for today. Um, so quick, quick kind of uh, introduction to AWS Retail. So my team, I uh, have a team of solution architects around the world that work with uh, top retailers and CPG companies like, like Adidas, for example. And um, a lot of what we do is bring the Amazon um, technology, not just from AWS, but across Amazon, to companies to sort of share how we do things um, also listen very carefully on, on what, they, what these uh, companies need and try to feed that back into our product teams as well. Um, we use this term born from retail as uh, sort of an underlining of our heritage in, in retail. You know, like AWS got started from the need for Amazon.com to scale and then we turned that into a business. But we, we you know, think that this is a differentiator for AWS for retail specifically because we have this retail heritage. And a lot of what we, we do is really try to um, take that technology out of the company and put it into uh, the products that we build uh, through AWS. So some examples of uh, customers. You can see we've got kind of a, a range of everybody in retail, CPG, different segments from um, you know, apparel companies that operate at global scales to um, grocery companies to, um, you know, you take like Mercado Libre, who's also a, a large uh, e-commerce in, in Latin America, to Sheen in China. It's a, it's a very global set of companies that we deal with. And so we see a lot of um, architectures. We work with a lot of these companies on a pretty technical level which gives us a kind of a, um, a, a privileged place to be able to absorb the information we get and build uh, on behalf of customers in a way that we think will actually work at the scale that these types of companies need to run at. And so uh, kind of some use cases from, from what we, we um, you know, at Amazon do in the retail sector. We have everything from you know, your, your e-commerce reviews to uh, cloud, obviously, we did the AWS, but it goes on to, if you take, take, take examples like personalization, we have a service called Amazon, Amazon Personalize. Well, that came out of Amazon.com. So did forecasting, so did call center as a service. And so a lot of what we do is we, we commercialize the inner technology from Amazon.com. And, and there's a whole bunch of other examples, even in the physical space, like uh, Just Walk Out, for example. Uh, came from Amazon Go, right? And Amazon One, the biometric uh, device to, uh, to identify you. Uh, dash carts, uh, you know, frictionless shopping. So in, in retail, whether it's digital or in person, we have a whole kind of spectrum of solutions that we can, we can bring to retailers. And then um, the, across Amazon, there's a lot of different business units. And, and what we usually find is um, for our largest customers, they're actually engaged with a lot of these, these different business units. And so one of the things we try to do in our team is sort of provide uh, a single lens that we can kind of connect these, these different uh, components. So for example, if you're using Amazon advertising and you're using um, a lot of analytics uh, technology from AWS, we can help with kind of bringing different parts of the businesses in Amazon together to, to develop solutions that you may um, find useful when analyzing your ads, for example. But there's a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, you, you can see just from the, the diagram, like Twitch, for example, is something that we, we spun out as a, uh, its own technology on Amazon uh, live streaming. And so 
th there's a bunch of examples of where we're taking um, retail technology and commercializing it. So the next thing I'll touch on is kind of more specifically to digital capabilities uh, on the cloud. And these are kind of the main categories that we um, operate within. So of course we have analytics, data lakes, um, smart stores, you know, these are th what I mentioned around just walk out, um, point, of point of sale, even video analytics. We have solutions around um, hardware that we've built uh, for, for um, you know, like Panorama is a, a video uh, piece of hardware that you can run inference at the edge in your stores to do things like people counting or hotspot analysis, things like that. Uh, digital supply chain, we have a lot of solutions in the, the forecasting and supply chain area. Uh, IT transformation, so we'll certainly talk about this today. Uh, Daniel will talk about this, I'll, so I'll leave, leave that for him. But in terms of app application modernization, we work a lot with customers that are moving from legacy systems to they want to go to a more modern container-based or serverless-based system. So being able to build out a transformation roadmap with customers is a lot of what we do. And then in uh, digital commerce, that's a huge area for us. Um, we're certainly seeing a lot of customers focused around uh, composable commerce and wanting to take the best in class for different capabilities that they see in the marketplace, whether that's like a loyalty provider or an order provider or a um, forecasting provider, and sort of assemble them in a way that makes sense for their business and supports the different channels they, they need to support. <clears throat> so, uh, and then finally, customer engagement. We see a lot of uh, use cases around um, powering agents, uh, whether those are customer support people or uh, actually associates in the, the stores through mobile technology, but we also see increasing use of generative AI. And so building applications on top of Bedrock to help associates answer questions, become more subject matter experts essentially in real time through uh, generative AI use cases. So I'll get a little bit more into that. And this is kind of the last uh, thing I'll say about Gen AI. I feel like we need to talk about it since there's so many uh, announcements about this, you know, this week. And so for retail and uh, CPG industry specifically, this is kind of the, the spectrum of use cases we deal with mostly. Um, of course, chatbots, I think that's like the number one thing everybody is experimenting with or has already. Um, where you can basically hook up a large language model to your product data set or your internal um, you know, repositories of information and then it can learn how to answer questions very quickly and that will basically power your, um, your agents who are on, on you know, call centers or you can um, expose this directly to consumers and they can interact with that directly. Uh, product descriptions, that's another big use case we see a lot of customers with e-commerce websites struggling with just poor product data. They don't have the, the descriptions or the metadata that they want, and so filling that in with generative uh, AI is, is a big use case we see. Uh, product design, I think we're gonna see a little bit of that in today's session, so um, I'll, I'll save that for Daniel to, to show. Recommendations, uh, content creation, basically just making your content better, which does lead to uh, better search engine optimization in some cases. Um, employee experience, you know, this is the kind of, uh, can you train people that are new in certain industries to do tasks? And, and, the, and the answer is like, yes, you can. You can actually um, train, fine tune models with your own data, your own training documentation, and basically have a way to kind of offload some of the training overhead that it takes to onboard new employees. Uh, faster software development. This one's kind of interesting. We th I think on my team specifically, we're dealing a lot with um, taking capabilities like, like I mentioned, like uh, you know, loyalty or forecasting or search and being able to develop providers uh, that implement those capabilities. All of that can be done with uh, generative AI. Um, so you can define an API, it can even help you build the API, and then you can ask it to integrate with another API. And just by showing the model, the two different APIs, you can actually ask it to build the integration. It might not work 100%, but it'll certainly give you uh, a good first start for a developer to, to go finish that. And so, so we're working a lot in that space. Um, and those are, so, so there's a couple other, you know, like Q was mentioned at the, for, at the um, 
session yesterday with, with Adam, and that's really interesting in terms of being able to just ask natural language questions to your enterprise data set. So it's about connecting data sets and asking um, just ad hoc questions that um, you know, natural language will be able to actually go and query your different data sets and bring back results. And then supply chain, there's some use cases there. Now, I think at this point I want to bring up Daniel, and um, we'll t I'll turn it over to you to talk about the Adidas story. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Good. Before I get to the core of things, I really have to say like one uh, disclaimer. I'm only here upstage because my line manager uh, couldn't travel here. Actually, it was his session. Um, so if you do like the presentation, it's all my fame. If you don't like it, I will give him the blame, right? So that's uh, uh, just for that. Uh, it's, it's actually his slides. Um, but let me start with the video that I brought to you. Um, and it's about reaching personal, personal bests. Do we have audio? No. You're doing a working and you're headed in the right direction. But that doesn't mean that you have to be satisfied with it. If you're setting out to break a personal best, if you continue to do that time and time again, eventually you'll get to where you want to be. It can take years to achieve that ultimate goal. You just have to keep going, keep training, keep on working with your team, keep on working with yourself, and remember that every day is a new opportunity to move forward. Yeah, so you have seen this personal best 96% recycled polyester, and I think like that's, uh, that's something that we are very, very proud of that we achieved uh, over the course of the last years by working together with our factories and our suppliers to find ways how we could harvest uh, plastic bottles from the ocean or plastics from the ocean from beaches collect them together recycle them into uh, into raw material and bring that back to 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 our products but you also see 96 percent is not a hundred right so we still have some some way to go and um, uh, what I want to say with that one is like for us it's always about reaching new <coughs> new levels reaching new highs setting new goals and uh, um, with that one there is the um, analogy of our company's business is performing like an athlete's body. Um, so it's all about training, 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 and working hard and trying hard and, and trying to improve yourself. And what does a body make, make out of you if you look at, uh, for instance, like long endurance runner, and uh, we have someone in our team, uh, uh, Ivan, who just did an ultra marathon around like 100 kilometers through the desert. Um, uh, obviously, it's, it's about the body that you need, so you need the, the physical stamina to do so, uh, but you also need the mindset. I mean, uh, at one point in time, it's just not, it's just not simply, uh, simply your stamina or your body defining uh, if you can reach the goal, but it's also uh, about your mindset and, and the brain. Um, and then it's about also having the heart um, and the driver to do so, right? So I'm having that healthy. And we will talk about these three, 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 three things today. Um, uh, uh, about the heart, about the brain, and, and about the body. Um, and uh, let, me, let me quickly start with, with what we consider our heart of the business. And uh, we just had the discussion before. I, I can't remember where he are there. Um, so, heart of the business, SAP system. So that's, that's really the core of our business that we are working with. And we are coming from an area where we are running today um, big, three big subsystems. Um, if you want to say so, we have a system for uh, finance, um, which is managing all of our financial processes. Uh, we have our retail systems for sales and services. Um, and we also do have a global procurement system. Um, and all of these systems have their challenges right now on their own. There is a high degree of customization that went in over the course of the years. I think we started our, our journey on AFS like 20 years ago, something like that. Um, and it took actually even 13 years to roll everything out globally um, uh, to be ready to accommodate local needs, and, and um, be it due to the business or due to some legislation. But it, it took some time to get there. And, and that is also lacking us right now or, or leading to, to a lack of flexibility in terms of reacting fast on, on supply chain topics. It's also 
it was built for a way, when you look at the retail system, it was built for a, for a world where everything was disconnected. There was a clear channel of wholesale business, there was a clear channel of retail and brick and mortar business, and there was a clear channel of e-com business. And e-com, actually, like 20 years ago, was a couple of million euros uh, of, uh, of yearly net sales. Uh, today, we are beyond the 4 billion euro uh, that we do in e-com, right? So you can imagine that this has, has some sort of an implication. And with all of these systems being disconnected, we also don't have a true um, planning process that is fully integrated. So there is a distinct financial planning process, there is a distinct supply chain process where we plan planning all of the demand. There is also some sales processes uh, for, for planning, uh, but, but it's all about like, you plan something, then you hand over, someone else has to do something like that. That's not a, not, that's not a fully integrated business, uh, sorry, a fully integrated planning process, and therefore we're having, we're having challenges and sometimes also hitting, hitting a wall with, with planning in the wrong direction. So, and with that one, three years ago, roughly, we started the journey of transforming and uh, moving from our old SAP uh, R3-based system um, to the new S4-based system. Um, and uh, one, of the, one of the functionality wise systems is already live, so finance moved to central finance, it's live since last week, uh, I see nodding. Uh, global procurement will go live next year, together also with our first market South Africa, and then by uh, August, um, respective October, we will have all of the three systems in one box um, living in AWS. What we also did, at that point in time is, uh, and you see a couple of numbers over here, is making the decision to move from uh, a hosted, co-located environment uh, to a system in AWS. Uh, so SAP, right now, the new environment is fully running in AWS. Um, and the reason for that was multifold. Um, uh, in AWS, we already have our analytics platform, which is based on Databricks, which I will talk about later as well. A lot of our core systems um, outside of SAP that we deal with, our e-com system is already running on AWS. Um, creation systems are running on AWS, and it was just a natural decision to say, like, okay, that's one of the last missing pieces that we also should move over there so that we have everything nicely tied up together. But just talking about a couple of the numbers, and, uh, and this, is the, this is the sizing, and I have to read it out. Uh, this is the sizing that we see right now. So right now, we are already running our uh, core financial system, <coughs> excuse me, core financial <laughs> system um, on a nine terabyte instance, of which we roughly consume seven, seven something after the cleanup, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and we already anticipate that by next year we will have to move to uh, an 18 terabyte uh, system uh, to fuel all of the three sus subsystems, right? So seven and a half that we, that we see, or actually a little bit more, is just finance, and then you can imagine supply chain coming on top um, and the country uh, of South Africa coming on top. That is leading then to, um, to this 18 terabytes. Um, so we were really, really glad, glad to see it because if we, if we roll out all of our countries um, by, I hope, 26, 27, um, then this would mean we land up, I think like the first projection was 80 to 24 terabytes, but it's definitely going beyond. So we were really happy to see the announcement on Monday uh, that the 32 terabyte instance are available right now based on Sapphire Rapids. Um, on the right hand side, you see that as well. Overall, the entire landscape is 160 systems, it's 6,500 vCPUs, and it's close to 80 terabytes memory across all of, the, all of the tiers that we are running. Now, talking a little bit about the tech, uh, uh, the, uh, the tech numbers, we also brought a couple of business numbers. So, uh, and you see that as well, we have more than nine billion financial operations going into, uh, into these systems, and that will go from 11 to 26 billion records when we fully roll it out. And by, according to SAP, that is, that is then one of the top 20 systems globally um, running, uh, running the, in the, in the FICO, FICO world, right? Um, and, and as well, this is, this is the other thing that we see. There is not, it's not stopping, it's a monthly growth. We will have more and more and more and more, and it's coming on top. With these 2,000 users that you see over there that are on average concurrently working on the system, we also see that it's uh, going beyond the 80% uh, CPU um, utilization during, during workloads. Um, but that already gives you an impression 
with what we have right now is definitely not sufficient for, for the future. But so one thing with hearts is you have to keep them beating, right? You can't just, uh, you can't just stand. Um, you maybe survive missing a beat. That's not, not a big deal. Uh, but what, what happens if the heart stops? And that's our core functionality system. We wouldn't, be do, uh, we wouldn't be able to do any financial processes, no procurement, no supply chain, and actually no sales. So that means the entire company stops. Therefore, what we do have, we have quite high um, requirements for reliability. And um, when you look at the left table, that's the amount of... Um, uh, that's, the, that's actually the numbers that we see for our SLOs and RTOs. Uh, so you see, like, on a disaster recovery situation, it's okay to bring back the system um, uh, in, in, uh, for four hours of data. But, but the aim is, like, bringing back the system within, within this 75 minutes if, if, if really, like, bad things are going to happen. And then on the right-hand side, you see actually tables that we... Uh, that we checked and, and, and where we also have uh, an SLA. <clears throat> and with the different sizes and databases, I mean, it was still okay on a six terabyte instance to go for uh, a classic EBS uh, a snapshot and, and restore, and, and that would potentially also work for nine terabyte. It's definitely not working if we're going beyond that. And therefore, very, very early in the process, uh, uh, we, we were also one of the I think like we were one of the first customers being then on, on FSX, FSX on tap with NetApp. Uh, so that's helping us bringing that back, right? So much about the heart, um, but we also need the right mindset and therefore we need a brain. Uh, and the brain for us is basically our data and analytics landscape. Um, and now you could argue when you, when you look at it, so um, on purpose there's two brain halves, left and right. You could argue right now when you look at this landscape, which is the creative left, uh, sorry, right side and which is the left side. But long story short, this is, this is, our, uh, this is our application landscape that we, uh, that we have over there. You see it's a wild mix of SAP and AWS, um, and then on storage of AWS and computer of AWS, there's on top uh, a Databricks layer, which is, uh, which is fueling our lake house. Um, and in reality, it's like all of the data by default goes into lake house. But in some certain situations, it just don't, doesn't make sense to wait for the data to be, to be synced out of an SAP system into lake house so that you can start reporting on it. Um, and for these use cases, we also have uh, um, the, the exception of going the, into the SAP analytics cloud and using, using that um, uh, based on an SAP uh, BW for HANA system. Uh, it, it said lean plus because it's there for planning. We need it anyhow for, for planning, but it's also there for additional reporting. Um, BI front end, we decided uh, some time ago to uh, fully embark on the Power BI journey because we clearly, clearly believe that um, uh, uh, data democratization and, and making that data accessible and also the tooling accessible for everyone to build their reports, what they need, connected to company data and potentially their private access um, is something that is, uh, that is moving forward. And then all the way to the left-hand side, you see the data science area. Uh, we talked about AI and ML and Gen AI, um, where I do have a couple of slides which are, which are coming, but this is where all of our AI work is happening, be it in SageMaker um, or, or be it in, in Databricks. Um, the reason for that one is, 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 is heritage. Some teams prefer SageMaker, some teams prefer to go to, go to Databricks. But let's look at the brain at work. And I brought you a couple of examples uh, as well. Um, so for instance, what we do or what we use it for, and this is just one of the use cases of the 50 something plus use cases that we have, where we are applying machine learning uh, for optimization purposes uh, is that we, uh, that we actually start with a similarity approach on do we already have a very similar article uh, in our range. So when we start planning our range, there is some sort of an analysis that you can run uh, internally and say like, hey, is that, is that actually something that uh, would sell or is that having a too big overlap to an article that we have? Um, because I think like a couple of years ago, so you went to our, our website and you said like, show me black hoodies uh, for men, and you found 157 results on average. Um, so please explain someone 157 black hoodies 
for men. Uh, it's definitely nothing that uh, that is uh, that is easy to understand, also from a consumer point of view. We went now down. I did the same test list lately. We went down to 40, which I think is still pretty high, but that's okay given the fact that we have hoodies for running, we have hoodies for biking, we have hoodies for for hiking, we have uh, uh, hoodies for the casual. Uh, um, uh, casual sports and so on and so on and so on, right? Even fashion when you look at Yoji Yamamoto, for instance. This, the second aspect is that we um, also look at sales performance uh, and, and analyze that one and, uh, uh, and bring, that, bring that together with the, with the article similarity and then looking at markets and competitors. Uh, so there is a there is a quite a significant process in how we analyze our our market situation and how we analyze our um, uh, our competitor situation, and when you bring down these three things together with an optimi optimization, then there is a human uh, guided process of using the AI. So it's about um, basically combining the best of both, both worlds because some people just have, have a feeling of what is going to sell. Plus additionally, some often planning is not incorporating what is going to happen in the world, right? So uh, yes, we can plan in there is a soccer world championship or there's Olympic games or something like that. But sometimes like smaller events um, uh, are unpredictable. Um, and, or better to say, unpredictable for the machine, and this is where the human behavior comes in, into play and, and feeding into that one. And then this is giving basically as an output the whole range for the next year plus some, uh, some planning how much to, to buy from which product uh, to actually be able to sell it to our consumers. Um, a, second, a second one um, is actually forecasting um, and decentralizing our forecasting process. <laughs> Uh, so you see here a couple of sage makers in the middle, but, but what we do is we use historical information of sales, what we know, with, uh, which is labeled with, uh, with um, specific events that might happen in the past, uh, as I said, um, championships, Olympic games, and so on. Um, com combine that with our demand plan, where uh, there is a, the human component coming in, where people say like, hey, this is we believe that this is going to be the, the next hot, hot sneaker on the market, so 2023. I think like it's something that if you are into sneakers, you, you figured out already the, Saba, the Adidas Samba is the sneaker to get. Uh, at least if you are 20 years and older, if you're maybe younger, then it's the, then it's the Campus 2000. Uh, and the Campus 2000 is an interesting aspect because we didn't predict it that this is becoming hot. It was just a TikTok trend. It happened, right? So it's, it's these kind of things that are, that are very unpredictable. And then last but not least, into the input process, we also have all of the product data, all of this product DNA, where we know um, this is what the, what the shoe is, uh, uh, is, is about. Um, we feed all of these kind of things together, and, and in the end, the output is uh, a plan which we can use to distribute the right amount of products into the right warehouses so that we are ready to sell and that the, that the supply chain uh, process are not taking too long. But that's ob obviously not the only thing that we do. We are also working, uh, and uh, who attended the keynote yesterday, so that, that we have been called out uh, uh, by Adam using AWS Bedrock. In fact, we, we were partner in the preview, and we started to develop uh, um, a chatbot or an assistant, you better can say, helping engineers finding uh, uh, around the organization and around like, how do I do certain things? How do I... How do I get an AWS account? How do I get to a Kubernetes namespace? What do I have to do to have a, a build environment? Uh, and so on. And, and, and that is sometimes for new joiners not very easy uh, to maneuver and, and find out what the real process is and what they have to do and so on. Uh, and this is where we, um, where we have quite a good amount of curated content already, uh, which is defining all of these processes. And we fed that into uh, in Titan embeddings put that into a vector, vector data store uh, and build an assistant on top using Langchain with Bedrock, uh, Titan in the background. And now you can ask simple questions like, hey, I need, I need some sort of an assistance um, to get to a Kubernetes namespace in AWS region, Oregon. What do I have to do? And then uh, the chatbot is able to answer that one. The second thing that we're doing is uh, running a pilot with AWS Code Whisperer. Um, obviously, I mean, that's, uh, that's something which is 
which was which was very very clear to us because it just makes sense to assist our engineers uh, with coding assistance and uh, and helping them to become more efficient and, and faster. Good. Let's talk a little bit about the body. Um, so. Uh, I, I mentioned it already, uh, e-commerce is an important aspect for us, and, um, uh, and, and training our e-commerce muscle over the, over the course of the years was, uh, was definitely something that we heavily invested into. So um, that's just some numbers. Uh, we really came from one release a month uh, in 2016 to now to a peak, actually that's the peak number, to roughly 300 300 releases a day. Uh, that's also due to the fact that we moved from a rather monolith setup into a microservice architecture uh, and automated a ton of these kind of things and aspects. Um, uh, but that is a very impressive number and it shows you like when you, when you do some certain things in a cloud native way and everything driven through um, EG GitOps, GitOps approaches, uh, that is definitely helping. Um, also the scale for Ecom um, is increasing significantly. Um, I mean, right now we are not working with, um, with Ye together anymore since roughly a year now. But, but when you imagine that you had sometimes sneaker on, on sale in e-com um, that 2 million people wanted, but you only had 20,000 pairs, you can, you can imagine that there is a certain amount of queue uh, and requests coming in per second. And that is um, what we have seen in peak is more than 300,000 requests per second hitting our, hitting our e-com services. So that's quite significant numbers as well. Um, and then just lately, and that's the last number, which I found very impressive, uh, we are in the pr process of moving from a commercial e-com provider uh, to our custom-built solution um, uh, that, we, that we did ourselves. And what we see over there when we launched them, we saw also a, a, a reduction of revenue loss to incidents. So the platform became more and more and more stable, uh, and, uh, and actually some, uh, some issues with fraud that we had in the past uh, are actually going away. But that's not the only thing that we do in e-commerce. I think like, that's pretty obvious. Um, but we're also a product company. And um, what we do is we create a lot of our products, and we create them for a couple of years already, very, very digitally, uh, in, a 3D, in a 3D manner. And, um, in the past, when we started this project, we had an on-prem render farm, which was under constant fire. I can't remember the amount of nodes. I think, like, do you know, Paul? It's like 20 or so. 20 machines, 20, 30 machines. It wasn't huge. It wasn't huge. Um, but we were working already with, uh, with a technology which was called the deadline scheduler uh, to schedule render jobs. Uh, and uh, that company got acquired by AWS and, uh, and gracefully um, for us, uh, it was quite nice because there was an integration to the render farm development kit. Um, and this is, this is something that we, that we started to implement and, and help um, scheduling these jobs and then having the, the R, R, RFDK spinning up render farms uh, or spinning up a, a big render farm uh, actually uh, in a huge amount of spot instances using GPUs to accelerate uh, in an automated process. And uh, I think the numbers are speaking for themselves, but, but like we are generating a huge amount of uh, product images in a 3D, in a 3D fashion in a, in a very fast way in a, and, and actually also in a very cheap way, right? Hmm? Let's see. So how that works is there is a, there is a new request coming to the queue um, by, uh, uh, by a designer or by a product manager saying, like, I now need for this product, which has been generated in 3D, I now need all of these assets for a B2B pitch or whatever. Um, and then this is triggering a step functions flow, uh, which, is then, um, which is then orchestrating all of the, the sub-jobs that we need to do. Uh, it's also not only following the happy pass, it's also looking into is there something, ran, did, did there something go wrong with the rendering as such, but, or maybe even if there, there is something, the rendering happened, but, but something with the images doesn't, um, uh, doesn't work out. And then from there, um, uh, it's, it's reported actually in a dashboard, so you see that as well. You see like uh, there is a, now in this example, we had 100, 130 jobs of which are runnable, 84 running, 350 uh, uh, succeeded and, and zero failing, right? 
Um, and then the output of that one is also then orchestrated uh, again through some, uh, through some uh, step functions and lambda functions. Um, being pushed to S3, and then finally, if it's approved from someone just looking over that there is nothing seriously going wrong, uh, which is certainly potentially something that we could that we could also fuel with Gen AI now on the on the on the review process. Then this is going into our asset management, and from there the workflow is uh, uh, is continuing to happen. So it might go on the website, it might go into a catalog, um, but it is then visible in in all of the other downstream systems. And with that, it's not the only thing. So Paul was mentioning um, some Gen AI that we are doing already, and actually we embarked the Gen AI story um, already quite some time ago. Um, and one of the projects, which is, which is very, very interesting, where I also brought a couple of examples, is uh, our own AI archive. So we have a huge archive of physical products uh, in our campus, uh, and of all of these physical products, there is um, a digital image from, from all kind of angles. Um, and what the team did is they trained a stable diffusion algorithm on 150,000 images of our, of our shoes. And now we have uh, an SD model, uh, which, is, which is basically fueled by all of our sneakers from the past and the present, and is helping us also to, to move into the future. And, and, and one of these examples you see over there, down there, um, it's maybe a little bit ugly, uh, but that's one of the outcomes that you, that you get uh, when you ask for, hey, can you generate a running shoe? Um, in fact, there is another one which just re recently now launched, um, is the Oz, Oz something, excuse me for not having the name present. Um, it looks AI generated. When you see the shoe, you will actually notice. Um, and that's actually the first shoe that went into production. It's now on sale. It just went into retail uh, these days, um, uh, which, is, which is made with these tools. And, and to, to show you a little bit how that looks like is um, I brought a couple of examples. So what you see over here is on the left-hand side, you have a, a terrace shoe, something like a gazelle, I guess. And on the right-hand side, you have an Adi Form Q. And you can, you can ask the systems, like, how would a, how would a shoe look like uh, that is a baby of these two, right? And, um, and the outcome is that one. And, and what this is being used for is the inspiration, as an inspiration for our designers. So they do go in and say, OK, that's pretty cool. I can work with, I don't know, uh, the second from the top right. Uh, this is a good inspiration. Let's go from there. And then they start to, to create some, si some stuff from, from scratch. The um, next example um, is also, we do often have collaborations um, with Disney, with, um, with Marvel. Um, uh, and, and here what we tried out is, how would a shoe look like if we would have a co collaboration with Gaudi from Spain? Right, and bring that together. And then the outcome is maybe not as compelling as the one before, uh, uh, but you already get the impression, right? So it's, it's, it's something that you could actually start thinking about and it's like, how would a shoe look like? And, and the AI is able to, to give you inspiration. And uh, as a designer, you can build on that one. And as a last example, uh, I maybe have something very, very crazy. So we do have this bearded guy. And, and obviously what you then see in the final results, you see that the beard is happening uh, and appearing in, in the outsole. Um, but, but that gives you an impression. It's, it's one of the tiny little tools that we had made available to our, to our designers. It's just one of those. We do have more, and there's more in the pipeline. Um, but uh, uh, it's very, very interesting to, uh, to explore these kind of things. In fact, this is two years old. So it was there before ChatGPT. Um, and uh, uh, this is something I'm, I'm, I personally was not involved, but I'm very proud of uh, that the company is working on that one. And right now, the next thing that they do is directly going to a 3D model. So uh, you took a little bit of in, take a little bit of input, uh, be it text or be it an image, or be it text in image, and then generating a 3D model out of it that you can then run through the rendering process. But okay, let me conclude then. Um, so we heard about the heart and how important it is that it doesn't stop. Uh, and that we can, that we can uh, uh, get it back to life, which is our IP system. Um, and as we only have one in the future, it's even becoming more important. We talked about the brain, 
and the insights, and it's important to, to understand the numbers and do something with it. But also not only the, the very, very uh, numbers-driven side, but also the creative side with, with Gen AI, what we see. And then we talked about our muscles uh, and that we are constantly working on that one, getting a stronger muscle in econ, getting a stronger muscle in, in, in all of our engineering pieces. And with that, I'm done with the presentation, Paul. <laughs>